Rebuilding a Stuart Models Twin Launch Model Steam Engine, this is part 19, setting up the valve gear and making the engine run. And the video starts off with me backtracking. When I fitted the piston rods and the piston rod glands, I used a couple of O-rings, a Viton O-ring and a silicone O-ring, and they were not successful. They didn't seal properly, because the engineering on this engine, to be perfectly honest, is fairly diabolical, and everything's quite sloppy. So here I'm reverting back to what I would normally do by fitting graphited yarn. This yarn is unpicked from a big piece of graphited yarn, so there's not really that much graphite in it, but there's enough. And once it gets full of oil, it does the trick. This graphited yarn is quite old, so it's the old stuff, the proper stuff. The modern stuff that's currently for sale, I really do not find very effective. When I first fitted the O-rings, it was very simple. I had the cylinder block in one hand, and I put the glands on and tightened the nuts. But now it's not quite so simple. These glands are right in the middle of the engine, and everything is in the way. And it's taking quite a lot of time, not to mention patience, to tighten them up, because I can only move the spanner a very small amount. So after a while, what seemed like an eternity, I've fitted one gland. The other one's still leaky. I'll show you the difference. When I put some air into the engine, look how much oil comes out of the gland. This is the one with the O-rings. So I do hope that the graphited yarn will create a much better piston rod seal than the one on the right. In this clip, I'm slackening the gland nuts on the other gland, the one with the O-rings in it. And this itself is quite difficult. I can only move the nut a very small amount to get it off the stud. And I have to concentrate on this because I do not want the nut to fly off and go on the floor, because if it does, it will be lost forever. In this clip, I'm cutting the O-rings with a pair of side cutters so I can remove them. And even removing them was quite difficult. They just seemed to refuse to come off the piston rod. But eventually, they did. Here's a good tip. If you've cut some O-rings like this, throw them in the bin, because otherwise you'll keep finding them on the bench, and you'll go, oh, some O-rings, I'll just put them in my box. But that is not a good idea, because you will end up with lots of bits of O-rings in your box, and then when you come to use the O-rings for a job, you'll get really annoyed when you pull one out, and it's already been cut. In exactly the same way as I've just shown, I'm wrapping some graphited yarn around the piston rod, and then by using a small screwdriver, I persuade it to go into the stuffing gland. You need to estimate exactly how much graphited yarn you need, and it's generally a good idea to make it a little bit long, and then cut it off in situ. Don't put too much graphited yarn in there, otherwise the gunmetal part of the gland will not seat properly in the hole. And also, if you put too much graphited yarn in the hole, the studs are not going to be long enough to allow you to fit the nuts to the gunmetal gland. Packing the second gland was easier than the first because I knew how much graphited yarn I needed. I didn't need to cut it off when I got to the end. And currently I'm just stuffing the last piece of graphited yarn into the gap between the piston rod and the casting. And then it's fun time. Now, this is really difficult. I can't get my big fingers in there properly. And getting this nut to sit on this gland was a real pain. The others went on okay, but this last one didn't. I think this is called Sod's Law or the Chaos Theory, that the last nut that you put in place is the one that doesn't want to go on there. And I don't want to drop it down onto the bench in case it pings off onto the floor, so I'm just being very, very patient here. And I really am trying to resist the urge to throw the stupid engine through the window. But, as it's not my engine, I don't think I should do that, really. I'll get my finger round the back and come at it from a different angle. That will work, surely. Um, yes, yes, um, no. And to make it worse, everything is oily. The parts are oily and my fingers are oily. So this last nut is proving very difficult to put on the stud. I'll try a different method. I'm using two small screwdrivers this time. And miraculously, one of them is magnetic. And this makes it much easier. So I'll remember that in future. Use a magnetic screwdriver and an ordinary screwdriver. This part of the job... I don't like very much. It's getting the thing to work. The engine is more or less fully assembled, but there are things in there that are not right at all. There's a problem with the valve. The other valve I've already set, and that is OK. And even though I set the valve as accurately as possible, I probably will still need to tweak it slightly by adjusting the eccentric 
when I come to do the final setup. This is a difficult one though because the design of this engine means that this part that holds the reversing lever fastens into the cover. So once the cover comes off, I have no way of fixing the reversing lever in any set position. For some reason this cover decided to be difficult to get off, and I don't know why, because it went on very easily. But anyway, it's going to come off whether it likes it or not. What I need to do is actually remove the valve, because the hole in the centre of the valve is not in the right place. So the valve rod, when it's moved by the valve gear, lifts the valve off the port face. And to get the valve out, quite a lot of the valve gear has to be disconnected. I'm disconnecting this arm from the eccentric, and I've already disconnected the valve fork from the expansion link. So now I can unscrew the valve rod and remove the valve. And here's the valve. And this hole is not in a good position. It's too small as well. So I put it in the machine vise, in the milling machine, and ran a very small milling cutter through it to make it into a slot rather than a hole. Once I'd done this, I refitted the valve and put all the valve gear back together. It was at this point that I noticed that the nut was just spinning free on one of the studs. So using a pair of pliers, I removed the stud. I wouldn't normally use a pair of pliers, not for fitting a stud anyway, but for removing the damaged stud, it's often the easiest and quickest way to do it. To refit the new stud, I used two lock nuts. And this is the way to do this, because then you don't chew up the end with your pair of pliers. So with the new stud now fitted in place, I can tighten all the nuts, and that will hold the cylinder cover firmly to the steam chest. And all the parts are fitted with gaskets, so there's no risk of a steam leak. I'm temporarily fitting the original inlet, which will be discarded. I'll be making completely new inlet and exhaust pipes in the next episode. This was one of the die blocks in the expansion link and it's made from brass which is no good, so I made a new one out of a piece of steel. And then I put some air into the engine. Well, it nearly runs. At least it's turning over. The engine is very stiff at the moment. Often when you rebuild an engine, particularly if you've made new parts, and I have of course made a new crankshaft for this engine, things are a little stiff. I'm not taking any of the blame, my crankshaft is okay, it's some of the other parts that are not so good. So what I did was, I turned up the air pressure, and I'm putting quite a lot of pressure into the engine at the moment, just to turn it over to free it up. Also of course, I've rebored the cylinders, and it has brand new piston rings, so the cylinders are a little tight also. I keep pumping oil into the inlet pipe, so that there's plenty of oil going into the cylinders, and this will ensure the very necessary lubrication that I need at this stage. Well, not me, I mean the engine. I ran the engine for quite a while, and I ran it for far longer than I'm showing on the video. By the way, the main bearings are still not tight. Whenever I fit a new crankshaft or any crankshaft to an engine, I keep the main bearings slack to start with. The last thing I want is to overlook something and score the main bearings. In this clip I'm trying running in the opposite direction and it's having none of it. It runs in a forward direction, but it will not run in reverse, which really makes it pointless having reversing valve gear. So why is this I wonder? And this may be down to the fact that the valve gear probably needs some adjustment. But before I do that, I'll just tighten the nuts on the glands to make sure that these don't leak. The engine is starting to free off a little bit. It's pointless adjusting the valve gear until the engine starts to run free. I'm adjusting this eccentric, which is one of a pair that operates the valve for this direction of rotation. So now I'm going to connect some air and see what happens. And we now have reverse, and it's starting to sound altogether better. There's still a way to go on the adjustment, but the sound it made at the beginning was encouraging. There was a hiss, and then the hiss stopped as the valve slammed onto the port and the engine started to work. I've now moved the reversing lever into the other position to make the engine go in the opposite direction. So I'm adjusting the position of the outer pair of eccentrics to make it run a little smoother.
and now the engine is running much smoother than it did before and I now have an engine that runs in both directions. There's a collar on the outer eccentric but the inner eccentric needs an allen key through the centre of it. That's why I drilled a hole in the eccentric strap to facilitate this. It would be a real pain having to remove the eccentric strap for every adjustment I needed to make at this stage. Quick and efficient setting of valve timing on a steam engine is one of these things that you need to have done it a few times and then you get a feel for it. But it always starts off with making sure that the valve travel is equal over the ports in both directions and that the lobe on the eccentric, the high point, is at 90 degrees to the crank pin and that should always be the starting point. I always like to really overdo the lubrication at this stage. I don't want anything to seize up or break. I'm literally flooding the engine with oil at the moment. And now for reverse. In the video it appears to run faster in reverse but it doesn't. It's just that this is an edited video and in real time I was making some more fine adjustments to the valve timing and in that time the compressor had raised the pressure. Now I've refitted the base and I'm just going to run the engine. So thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.